tonight, and uh, I think every one of us will walk away learning something new, even myself. So please welcome Nick Cook. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> as Dennis said, I have, I've been doing this a long time. I'm old school, as Dave said. And uh, I learned from some of the best. Rudy Osonic was one of my mentors, and uh, he used to get after me all the time. And it, he's the one that told me that if I wanted to make money at this, that I should find small things that I could make quickly and sell for under $50. And I've been doing that for a long, long time. I literally paid my mortgage with wine stoppers for 15 years. And over a quarter million wine stoppers. So, you know, about two and a half minutes a piece. I still do them occasionally. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I'd probably do the widest variety of wood turning of anybody. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Braves came to me and I turned an eight foot baseball bat for them. Um, the same week, I did a 60 inch uh, drum major's mace that was three and a half inches at the top. It came down bulbous down to one inch and at the other end, it was five eighths of an inch. They put a hammer head on top of it and it's for a commercial that Home Depot is fin uh, filming right now. And I mean, it's just something weird every day. So I do table legs, I do newel posts, I do, um, I did some nine foot uh, post for the uh, restoration of the Martin Luther King house in Atlanta. Uh, I just did 12 uh, eight inch by 60 inch columns for some weird movie called The Conjuring 3, which it's a supernatural horror film that it's the third edition and apparently for the kids it's a great deal. So, <laughs> but uh, I was getting on the elevator at the hotel in, uh, in Raleigh and these two guys were, as I walked on, said, nobody can make a living turning wood. And I said, excuse me, <laughs> I do that. So um, I've been very fortunate to travel around. I've been to 40 some odd states. I've been to Australia, New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, uh, Canada, England, and Ireland doing turning. So in the past 26 years, we've had about 150 wood turners uh, stay with us at our house. So we run a bed and breakfast for indigent wood turners from all over the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we're pleased to be able to stay with Dennis and Nikki, a very fine host. And we're enjoying ourselves. So I'm going to start off tonight. Woody has asked me to do a, uh, a burn brim plate, platter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's not as big as I normally do, but I want to get a couple of other things in. So we're going to keep it quick and, and moving on. Uh, I like ash because it cuts so well. It finishes well, and it really does burn well. And by burning it and cutting it away with an abrasive, you get a, a really organic texture that's kind of nice. Plus you've got the contrast between the white and the black. So if you have any questions, either yell at me or throw something at me. Sometimes I don't look up. Yes, sir. Uh, when people ask questions out of the audience, mm -hmm. if you could repeat I the question, repeat yes, I all right, so. that would help with the all video right. recording. And I, I am old school and I do break some of the rules of AAW. Uh, just ignore them. Um, <laughs> They tell me I'm not supposed to move the tool rest with the machine running. If I stop to turn the machine off every time I move the tool rest, I'd never get anything done. My friend Rudy Osani, uh, he, he presented me with this mini spur drive center. I don't know if you can see it. But uh, he invented this probably 30 years ago. And he said, son, you wasted too much time turning that machine on and off. So when I do baby rattles and honey dippers and things like that, that's what I use. So. I do use gloves when I put the piece on because I spin it on. Well, it ran a while ago. Okay. I'm using a quarter inch shim because this is uh, six quarter material. And uh, if I put the screw all the way into it, it will show up when I least expect it. So, and we hate it when that happens. 
going to locate the center. I use a three inch inch bowl gouge and I don't know, can we see this? The, the grind that I use is relatively blunt on the end, but I find that I can do everything I need to do on a bowl with this tool. I don't have to have four grinds like Stuart Batty and, and Mike Mahoney. Um, I don't have a bottom feeder, but uh, this does everything I need it to do. Does anybody know the proper speed for turning? Or the, the formula for finding the proper speed for turning a bowl or a plate or a platter? You don't know that? I have a chart on my wall. A chart on your wall. Okay. I do. Okay, I do. that's fine. The, the recommendation <coughs> is the diameter times the RPMs the result should not exceed 9,000. So just for a rough thing, we use 900 for a 10 inch wall. So just keep that in mind and we all turn faster than we should. The first thing I'm gonna do, this was a plain surface piece of wood, but I always surface it on the lathe as well. Uh, if you look at it, it's got a little wobble to it. Uh, anything that's eight to 10 inches or wider is probably gonna cup after you plane it just a little bit. We had some rather, rather cup pieces. Uh, they weren't plain, but still, it's possible to do this. I'm going to mark the center again. And I'm going to use a talon chuck. And these are the two inch jaws. And I know a lot of people set their uh, <coughs> dividers or their calipers for two inches and try to line up the lines. Use the radius, it works. And I set it for one and a sixteenth. That gives you a little play. I'm gonna use a bedan tool for cutting the recess. And depending on the chuck that you use with a, a talon like this, <coughs> You need straight sides. If you're using the uh, dovetail jaws, you need to dovetail it. So this is a 3 8 inch pedan tool, right at the center line. Nothing more than a square nose scraper. With the Nova chuck and the big marks, they are dovetail. This has two little teeth on it, and both of those teeth should be inside the recess. If you're gonna dovetail it, you can buy one of the dovetail tools it cuts up underneath, you can take this and you can just push it underneath like that and get the same result. So, you look like you have a, a question. No. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> inquiring. So, I'm making the base roughly half the overall diameter for a plate or a platter. 40 to 60 percent is a good size to make it. If you're doing a more vertical bowl, you can go down as small as a third. I used to do a lot of hollow vessels and I made tiny little bottoms and my wife hates them because she said they're too easy to knock over. They're not functional. Everything I do pretty much now is usable. So I'm gonna take my tool, hold it about 45 degrees this way, roll it about 45 degrees this way. And the glove on the left hand provides a little insulation for uh, the wood coming off of the tool. The more you can do this in one continuous motion, the cleaner the curve's going to be. I see a lot of beginners that they start out and they just cut straight following the tool rest. It becomes a conical form. It's not very appealing, and it doesn't feel good. If you have a nice curve here, it fits your hand better. The more you can do this in one continuous motion, the better it's gonna be. And at this point, we can make a foot on this. And you can do a foot that's straight up and down, which works. You can make a foot that's chamfered, 
but typically if you do either one of those, you're gonna to have to fold sandpaper and put it in there to clean it up. So I tend to do a little radius here, a little reverse curve. And if you make the foot, <coughs> excuse me, roughly the same height as the depth of your recess, then when you go to see how deep it is, how thin it is, you actually have something to gauge it by. You're not gonna be able to get your uh, double-ended calipers inside the chuck. So just keep that in mind. It's also fun to guess at it, and you know you don't really want to see the chuck jaws, but it has happened. So for a finishing cut, and this is a pretty clean cut, I'm gonna move the tool rest way over so that I can put the tool almost straight up and down. This is not gonna be in the way and this is not gonna be in the way. And I'm gonna use the longest part of the bevel to make this cut. And I'm looking for very fine, what I refer to as angel hair. I don't know if you can see this, but these are the shavings that I'm getting. I don't like the sand. I don't know anybody that does enjoy sanding. But when you start getting stuff like that, you're getting a clean surface. And I like to start sanding with like 180 grit. I'm applying almost no pressure at all. And I'm riding on that longest part of the valve. And that can be sanded very easily. The other thing that I do, because in the first and second grade, they told me to write between the lines, I use a point tool and put two little circles and that's where I sign the piece. I put the year in the uh, type of wood. If you put the key into the chuck and lay it on the tool rest, instead of turning off or locking the spindle, you'll get the piece off and not the chuck off. Your recess, excuse me. Down the wrong way. The recess that you do, or the tenon that you do on your pieces, should be as close as possible to the fully closed chuck. You don't want to do a three inch recess and use number two jaws. If you do that, you're going to have four little tiny points that make contact. So. Keep that in mind, I see it happening all the time. Now, I haven't done anything to this, and I frequently use a, uh, a vacuum chuck and when I do the vacuum chuck, I did 1,350 dinner plates one time uh, for corporate gifts. And I created two vacuum chucks, one for doing the front side, one for doing the back. I did the back first. I didn't have to be real particular about the recess because I just rolled it in, so I didn't have to put a chuck in it. But I cut all the pieces within a 32nd of what they needed to be to fit into my vacuum chuck. The first ones I did, without a recess. And after the third one sliced past my left ear, because there was nothing to keep it from moving this way, I decided I should probably put a recess in here. And I did that, and it was about an eighth of an inch deep, so I could not touch this with it in there. So I brought it out to here, and then once I turned it over, I made a, a chuck that would fit this section, and I had a marker to mark them and it would center up and I could clean this up. 
So I just do that on a regular basis now. And I'm gonna do that with the tool vertical again. And I'm doing that really fine cut. If you take the tool and bring it up, and it's not clean yet, uh, and you catch a place right here where the grain is coming down, it will flip this off and you'll have a little straight edge there. Do not put your finger up here and check it to see if it's round with it spinning. I'm checking it now and I see bandsaw marks. You can cut yourself that way. I saw Ray Key slice his finger open doing that. I'm going to do a real light cut across the face just to make the top and bottom parallel. that wide. I don't measure things like this. I'm going to make the high point here. It's going to be a crown rim and I'm going to burn it. Are there any questions? Y'all getting awfully quiet. Do you realize there's going to be a test after this? I don't see anyone taking notes. I do a lot of school deals and it just, I mean, they just panic when I say that. So, so I'm going to roll this outward. Gently. And I'm going to leave a little square edge out here. I don't want it to be really sharp. But I don't want to bullnose this either. And then I'm going to roll it in this way. And this time, I'm going to roll past where I want the uh, burn area to be. Because if I just roll it into that point, it's going to leave a little V and the flame will not go down in there. Learn that the hard way. Typically, I don't sand that at all. It's not a bad idea to brush all the shavings off the lathe when you do this. <laughs> I mean, we are in the fire department, right? <laughs> Shouldn't be a problem. But smoke Nick, detectors that we know of. No, no smoke detectors in the fire, but Union Hall. <laughs> no fire extinguishers. I, I have never had a problem. Um, the first time I did this at Provo, it was when it was still at BYU, and I was in a classroom on the second floor. And Kip Christensen, who's a professor there and put all the things together, he said, if by any possible chance you set off the fire alarm, the sprinkler system, or anything like that, you will never see your family again. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been directly under smoke detectors. It's never been a problem. You just have to be gentle with it. You can't just set the place on fire. So... And you want a, a propane, not map gas. Map gas burns entirely too hot, and it just reacts too quickly. Um, 
and you want to go slowly. And initially, I'm just going to go over it very lightly, and you can almost create something that looks like zebra wood. You have to be a little bit more careful. And I've done some platters and sold them like this. They take a little too much time and effort. You keep abrading it away and then going back over it. So, and that's that's not very uniform, but you can see what I'm, I'm trying to do. And you do have to be very slow and very methodical about this if you want to get that result. I don't like that result. Yes, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, at this point, uh, should you share all your sanding at the burn be done? Um, actually, it doesn't make any difference because I'm going to abrade it later with scotch Brite. So, I mean, the sanding is... I mean, the interior is going to be sanded later as well. So, no, it, it doesn't, it's necessary. So, and you can probably see those little lines in there, but they're going to disappear. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to burn it. And you know, every once in a while, a little flame will pop up. But it doesn't last long. Like that. And originally, I, when I first started doing this, I kept a spray bottle of water and uh, would put it out. But I mean, they dissipate quickly. We had uh, Chris Stott, who has long since retired from wood turning. He was an Englishman who came over here frequently. And we went to, to do a demo. I took him and he wanted me to bring oil finishing oil. And I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, I put it on before I burn it. So it just goes, poof. <laughs> so no, I, I don't like that. This is a little slower to react, but it does work. So I'm going to burn this as evenly as I can. And it's hard in a demo to, to take the time to do it, but you'll get the idea. It blows out too. Why did you burn it the first time with the going back? I'm sorry? Why did you go around the first time with this kind of I was just showing what it would look like if you just and all it does is sort of scorches the, the summer growth. So you can get an almost zebra uh, wood effect. So, so now I'm, I'm intently burning. Why, why can't you just turn the machine on slow and just pull? Well, it's actually kind of fun if you turn it on about 3,000 RPMs and really crank up the flame, it becomes a flamethrower. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, <clears throat> and, and I suppose you could do that, but I can't see what I'm doing when it's rotating. So, I mean, you, you could probably do that and hold the flame in one place, but I haven't been that adventurous. Okay. <laughs> but with 3,000 RPMs, we could probably do matching. Yeah. So, <laughs> only once. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I'm going to finish up the, the initial burn. <clears throat> And I try not to burn the, the rim, so I'm, I'm aiming it up and away from the rim. Sort of like watching paint dry, isn't it? This is more fun, though. Okay. So I try to get a uniform burn. I take 
make scotch bright. And this is why I wear the rubber gloves. Uh, it's not so that I don't get burned because they're not good for that. Uh, but I scotch bright it with the grain. And what it's gonna do is cut away the softer grain. Have you tried using like a brass brush? To As a that? matter of fact, I'm glad you asked that question, Woody. I have, um, but only after <coughs> I've, I've done this. And I use scotch brite because it follows the grain and it makes it more organic because it, it's just, I mean, it, it gets the softer places and not the hard places. I've done it with a, a regular wire brush. And when you do that, the wire brush leaves an indentation in it, which makes it very linear. And it looks more mechanical that way. The brass brush, after I do all the burns and all the abrading, I have taken a soft brass brush and rubbed it across there and it leaves little brass particles in there. And then you have to put a finish on it so they don't disappear. So but we'll get to that in just a minute. So. Is that the green dollar spot Scotch Brite? Uh, it is. It's what you can buy in the paint department at Walmart or anywhere else. So I just try to keep it as close to following the grain as I can. And I'm gonna do another quick burn. And typically on a big platter, I'll do three or four burns and that makes the, <coughs> the texture a little more intense. But you'll get the, the basic idea here. Now, many, many years ago, uh, when Phil Brennan was the president of AAW, he passed away quite a while ago. On the very cover of the AAW journal, he took a hollow vessel and covered it with gunpowder and set it off. And I didn't think that was a very good idea. Um, and we had lots of comments about that, but you know, it just didn't seem right. I don't mess with gunpowder. You know, fire is a little bit different, but that was just a little scary to me. So I'll go back and forth and abrade it and burn it and abrade it and burn it so that I get a real intense black, but I'm also get the texture that I'm looking for. And you always want one of those with the trigger on it. You don't want to have to do the other method. Nobody ever has a lighter or whatever. So after I get this completely abraded, and I'm happy with the intensity of the black. Before I take the center out, I would spray it with matte lacquer, or the matte fixative that Crowline sells. And I use the matte because if you use satin or semi-gloss or gloss, then you pick up reflection off the black. And I failed to bring that with me. So we're just gonna fake it. And this is why I wear the gloves. Gets under your fingernails and all that. So at this point, I would take an air compressor, airline, and I'd blow it out real good and I would spray the rim with the matte lacquer. And that would set it so it doesn't come off in your hands when I pass it around. I'll be able to tell who touched it when you leave here. Um, the other thing that does is it keeps the really fine dust when I get inside and start sanding it, it sort of settles in the grooves and all. And if you don't lacquer it before you do that, 
it's there forever. So, so any questions about the burn? 3,000 RPMs, crank it up, make a flamethrower. Most fun you've ever had. <coughs> so I do that before I cut into it so that I get a nice clean line. And everybody knows to anchor their tool before you make the cut. Anchor the tool, find the bevel, and make the cut. It's really important here. If you don't have it anchored and it skates out, You've just ruined everything that you did. Trust me, it's happened. <laughs> I hate it when those things happen. But if it can happen on the lathe, I've had it happen. So, again, anchor it firmly. And usually I do 14 to 16 inch batters. But for a demo, they just take way too long. I like to do and make a couple more steps here. I think that's about the right width. I'm going to come back with a quarter inch bowl gouge that has a longer bevel on it. It's round more like a spindle gouge. And it's going to allow me to get just a little bit under the lip. And everybody seems to like to do the undercut, but everybody tends to make it a little bit too much of an undercut. All you need is a, an eighth to a quarter of an inch, and that's going to create a secondary shadow line, and it already looks deeper than it is. So it just accentuates the burn and it makes it appear to be And again, you have to anchor the tool. I try to make that in one continuous motion so that there's not a lot of sanding to be done. but I would bring it in probably two inches or more because while you've still got the mass in here, you've got support for it. When you take all that out and you try to go back and clean this up, it's going to wobble on you. started working with Rio Sonic, every time he turned the ball, every cut that he made went from the rim all the way to the center. It takes a long time to develop that. But if you do, you're going to have a much better surface. Oh, not just I'm going to take off my gloves. <laughs> No better than that. There's just a tiny little place there. And one of the things I like to point out to people that haven't turned much is you notice I'm coming in from an angle here. 
Never let the bow gouge finish up at 90 degrees at the center. It becomes a drill bit. So, this isn't much of a collection plate, but um, if you hold it by the bottom, you won't, uh, won't hurt anything. <laughs> 